Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, gifted for more, we're in the last uh, part of the sermon series on this uh, sermon series in Bible class from uh, Lutheran Hour Ministries. And the title for today's sermon, Here I Am, Send Me, and it is from the uh, passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. And that's uh, what we're going to be using as the spirit uh, of our sermon for today. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the whole house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a burning, burning coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my lips, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your sin is taken away, and your guilt is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord calling, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our risen and ascended and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Amen. So this is the conclusion of this sermon series on how God blesses us with his gifts and how we can use them for him and for his kingdom and each other. And so for the last five weeks, now make it six, we've been focusing on how God is so incredible with us and how he blesses us and how much he blesses us with. And out of that realization of his blessings, he calls us to respond to those blessings by living in their power and by sharing them with others. He's given everything to us, his kids, and he calls us now to be ready to be used for his work. So just like the prophet Isaiah, we are called to respond to him with an enthusiastic, here I am, send me. So I've been preaching to you for the last few weeks about gifts and, and what they mean and what it all means for us. I'm going to do something I don't normally do today, and we're going to have a little bit of a pop quiz, okay? See if any of it sank in. So let's, uh, let's ask a few questions about the topic we're discussing. We're going to do that in a true or, f true or false uh, setting. And let's put the first one up there, okay? Everyone on the face of the earth has been blessed by God with special gifts, true or false? True. Let's put the answer. There we go. All right. All of us are a gift from God, and all of us have been blessed with special gifts. All right. Next statement. Let's put it up there. All humans are created in God's image and are special to him. True or false? True. We are the crown jewel of the creation of God. And that is saying something because this God can create. And he says, you humans are created in my image. All right, next statement. Using your God-given gifts is good for you. True or false? True. When we are using those gifts, we are more joyful, we are more content, and we are more helpful to the rest of the kingdom. All right, next statement. If you don't have the same gifts as others, you can't be used for the kingdom of God. True or false? False. God gifts all of us differently so that we can play the part in his kingdom that he needs us to. And having different gifts is crucial. You don't want a body that is made up entirely of hands or entirely of feet. It just isn't going to work that well. All right, next statement. When others look at us, they should see the fruit of the Spirit at work. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. True or false? True. true. Very true. Jesus said we're supposed to bring these things into our lives and cultivate them and then cultivate them in the world. All right, next point that we were talking about. Let's put that up there. We are built for isolation, not community. True or false? 
False, very false. Isolation is what the enemy likes. Community is what God has designed us for. All right, next point. It is important to evaluate and identify your gifts. True or false? True. How can you use something if you aren't aware that you have it? And again, if you haven't taken the gifts inventory, I am up here as a full-grown man begging you. Please take that, okay? And when I'm, when I'm in the line here, I'm going to be handing those sheets of paper out. Okay, please, 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 please take that inventory. And if you won't listen to me, then will you listen to this? Let's put the, there we go. Come on. I will, I will do anything, <laughs> anything I can to get you guys to do this, all right? All right, next point. Let's put it up there. Trinity Lutheran Church and School need or needs you and your gifts if we are going to realize our potential, true or false? True. And notice how big those letters are, okay? That is the truth, pun intended. The local congregation needs its people to use their gifts in order to be a thriving and healthy community. If it doesn't work that way, it gets really out of balance and out of whack. Do you guys know what the 80-20 rule is? It's also called the Pareto Principle, and it states that 80% of the work in any community is done by 20% of the people in that community. Now imagine what kind of work can be done when that ratio is evened out. Hell can't stop us when we get together united by the power of God and using his gifts. And here's a simple practical question. Don't you want to be part of a community that is working together in ways that are effective and powerful? I can't answer for anybody else in here, but I do. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about what is happening at Trinity right now. And I got to tell you that as we've gone through this, this sermon series, it's, it's so cool. Anytime you get to be around the Word of God, you learn something about the Word of God. You learn something more. You grow in your appreciation of God more. In this sermon series, I already had a heck of an appreciation for you as a congregation. But this sermon series has really made me hone in and kind of box out some of the other stuff going on and made me really appreciate every week as I got up and looked eyeball to eyeball at people that do so much for this community. God bless you. And this sermon series has made me appreciate it, made me excited about some things. But I'm also excited about what is happening here because for the first time in my 10 and a half years here, I believe that we have a shot to take a step forward into a new area and do some new things at this church and in this church community and thereby the community of Springfield at large. We have this talented group of workers coming into our midst. And in the recent past, we've added some talented workers who have built and used their talents to build on the talents that were already here in this community. And I really honestly believe that God is prepping us and positioning us to be a community that does massive destruction to the enemy and his plans. But we all need to be involved. And we all need to use our gifts for your congregation. And remember, this is your congregation to see that potential fulfilled. So again, please take the gifts inventory. Listen to the kitty cat with the big eyes, you know, because I hear so many people saying to me, hey, the world we live in, it's a total train wreck. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, this is how Christians change the world, guys, through our gifts and using them together in fighting the enemy. It's not by shouting louder than the other guy. It's not by having a better blast on social media than the other guy. It's not about having a better marketing plan than the non-believing world. It's by using our gifts in the world and in our community that we will make a change. And I'm not smart enough to come up with that. That's God and his promise. Now, one thing I got to be clear about is I'm talking, talking to people about using their gifts around the church. This is one of the things that you always got to make sure is, uh, is clear. God, when he says utilize your gifts and use them, he's not talking about you in your other vocations and callings, you know, working a full-time job or doing whatever you do in your callings. And we all have a ton of them now in the 21st century. He's not talking about doing all of those things and then adding another 40 hours a week to do stuff here at Trinity. That happens, unfortunately, sometimes, and I try and squash that as soon as I can. 
But if we all just did a few things here and there, it's rewarding and it won't take much time and this will be a different ministry. And I understand that maybe people don't know how they can get involved at the church or the school here. So I brought a slide along with me. Here are a few ways that, that people can help out, and we're going to put a call out for these things and more in the future. So let's put that up there. All right, we need, we need greeters here at the church. When somebody comes in, they should be welcomed with uh, open arms. We need ushers. Man, our ushering staff has is, is been very depleted uh, recently, and we need help in organizing the services and whatnot. We need help working on the facilities. We got roughly, oh, I don't know, 57 million square feet of <laughs> facilities here, it feels like, and we have to take care of those. We have to be good stewards of those. We need help at sporting events at the school. We need, if you're good with finances, we need people to help out in that area so we can always be making sure we're keeping track of things and that we are planning for the future and that we are transparent. We always need help with the youth group. We always need help welcoming new members. We need help for our prayer ministry, for our grief ministry. And I could go on and on and on and on until we have to get to the ordination service about what we need to do here. But here's the deal. So much of what happens here is led by volunteers. And what we are getting ready to start uh, here uh, is going to be very crucial. And I think it's one of the most important ministries. And I can say in 182 years of ministry at Trinity that has ever been introduced here, we're about ready to get it started. Let's put it up there on the wall. It's called Stephen's Ministry. It's a care ministry that is led by the laity, that's you, of, of the church. And it can do stuff in ways that is way more effective than the clergy can ever do. Look out for that announcement. And the announcement's coming soon. Lots of ways that you can get involved. And like I said, you're going to be hearing about them in the months to come. My prayer is that we would all be open to that. And let's allow God to use our gifts that he's blessed us with in new ways. Not in our ways. In what we think should happen or worse... The worst thing that happens in a church, just keep doing what we've always done before. You know, that's the, that is the epitaph that is on the tombstones of so many churches. Well, we always done it that way. Yeah, that's how a church dies. That's dangerous. And so we want to be listening to God like Isaiah, responding to God like Isaiah, and getting out and going into the trenches like Isaiah, not bringing our own presuppositions into everything and trying to tell God how this all ought to work. Okay, so I've been waiting for 16 years to use this illustration, and I never had the right context to do it, and today I believe it is the right time. So it's a very lengthy story. I'm going to try and abbreviate it for the, the sake of, of this sermon. So here we go. A guy from Seattle, me, moves to St. Louis, 2,000 miles away to go to the seminary and meets a girl from Chicago, Karen, and they get married. Paul meets Karen's lifelong friend from Chicago, a girl named Kathy, and her husband, Matt, who's from Springfield, and they all get to know each other. So one day, Paul and Karen are at Kathy's parents in Chicago, and they meet Kathy's grandma, Grandma June. I've gotten permission from the family to tell this story. In the it's a small Lutheran world category, it just so happens that Grandma June is from Washington State, where she went to church with and hung out every week socially with Paul's grandma and grandpa. Turns out Kathy's grandparents and Paul's grandparents, mine, were very close friends. And when I told that to my mom, she's like, oh yeah, I know June very well. So June is this hardcore Lutheran, and she is very happy that one of Kathy's friends has married Paul and Lillian's kid, that's my grandparents, and is now going to be a pastor's wife. So we're all getting together, and we all sit down on the couch. Grandma June is in the middle. I'm on her right, and Karen is on her left. And so after she talks to me about my grandparents and what they used to do when they would hang out and everything, and, and my time at the seminary, she turns to Karen, and she asks her about being a pastor's wife, and, and what does she do for the church? And that conversation went something like this. 
So you must be the Sunday school superintendent, right? Karen says, no, that, that's not really my gift. Oh, okay, you're musical. You play the organ then. Karen says, no, <laughs> I'm not really good at music. Well, you have to be in the choir, right? Karen says, no, I, I can't really sing. And Grandma June, without thinking about it, just paused for a second and then blurted out, well, what do you do? And it wasn't just the comment and blurting it out. It was also the look of disgust on Grandma June's face that let us know how unhappy she was with my wife's answers. But it was also when she was done asking the questions about what she thought every pastor's wife ought to be doing, and Karen answered them so wrongly, that she literally turned on the couch and faced me with her entire back to Karen as if to say, I have no use for you now. <laughs> Side note, when Karen was growing up, she was a goody two-shoes and the favorite of her friend's parents. She got good grades. She never got into trouble. She respected authority. All her friend's parents wanted their kid to hang out with Karen, all that good stuff, right? So later that night, after we get done talking with uh, Grandma Jean, Kathy and her husband, Matt, and Karen and I go out to dinner, and we got in the car. And Kathy is grinning from ear to ear. And she said to Karen, finally, someone has disappointed Grandma Jean more than me, and it's you of all people. Yeah, Karen did not fit into Grandma June's definition of what a pastor's wife should do for the kingdom of God. And this is where I'm going to get real with you. The irony is she had no business judging what anybody else ought to be doing for the kingdom of God. Another part of the irony is, is at the time, my wife was a senior marketing manager for Concordia Publishing House, and she was in charge of marketing millions of dollars of materials to the entire world so that the gospel of Jesus Christ could go out to the ends of the earth. She won't tell you that. I will. She was aware of her gifts and how to use them for the glory of God, way better than she would have been using them if she tried to fit into somebody else's box or idea of what she ought to be doing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what we have to do with each other. Lovingly support others when we see something that is a gift. But you have to be careful too. Don't let your preconceived ideas of what you think somebody ought to be doing get in the way of what God has actually gifted them to do. And don't criticize them for not doing what you think that they should do. That's trusting in our own understanding. And one of the biggest things that is hurting churches right now is that. Instead, we should all be listening to God, all ears to God, and what He has to say to us. So are we like the world and focused on our plans? Or are we like David and can be described as a man after God's own heart? And that is what really is at the core of this sermon series. Let's put it up there. It's your heart. That's what this is asking. Where is your heart at? Is it where God can use it? Is it open to his word, not your word? Open to his guidance, not the way that you want to go. Open to seeing his potential for his world, not so sold out to your preconceived notions that you judge everybody else. Are we ready to hear the call of God and say, here I am, send me? See, Jesus Christ died for us so that we could live that way, so that we could be free to work in his kingdom. We're gifts with gifts to bless the world with. So let's answer that call and let's let God make our community the very thing that he wants it to be. God bless it to be so. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you for the numerous blessings you give us. Lord, help us to have the wisdom that comes from above so that we are ready and willing to listen to you always, that we would have a heart that is constantly seeking your desires. Lord, I ask that you would bless everybody within our community here at Trinity and all Christians everywhere, that we could be the people you've called us to be. 
And we can do that because of nothing of our own, but because of your son, Jesus Christ, in his work and in his name we pray. Amen.